Okay, here we go. We're gonna get started really soon. I'm so excited. I have a really important job to welcome everyone. And we have such an incredible team at MVP. I can't say enough incredible things about our team. I just feel so lucky. There were so many people who worked really hard to make this happen. So shout out to the entire comms team, the entire donor organizing team. And because we are such a leaderful team, um, and the theme tonight is, can we really win this? We're so close. We're getting so, so close. Um, I am going to pass it off to my really awesome colleague, Cindy Matthew, who curated the, yes, we can. Oh yeah. Introduce yourself in the chat. Um, where are you from? Where are you calling from? What are you thinking about this election season? And yes, introduce yourself. Very good. Um, so I'm going to pass it to my awesome colleague, Cindy Matthew, who curated um, tonight's presentation with all the speakers. And I'm going to disappear until the very end when I get to introduce one of our incredible donor organizers, Becky Liebman, who's going to um, close us out. So without further ado, I uh, will pass it over to you, Cindy, to get us going. Thanks, Billy, and thank you all for joining. Um, so here we are, we're a little less than three weeks out from the election. And as you all know, our ability to hold and continue to win on the issues we care about, from climate justice to reproductive rights and everything in between, is dependent on our ability to hold and expand electoral wins. Elections matter for policy, and policy matters to our lives. We need to hold power at the federal level with the House and the Senate, and we need to win a number of state executive and legislative seats. And that's why we're so excited for you all to hear from our speakers today. Um, so today you'll be hearing from Latasha D. Mays, who is a candidate for Pennsylvania State Rep. Then Jama Bickley King from Target Smart will dive deep into some data with us. You'll hear from MVP's Katie Sipp on the critical work happening in Pennsylvania. And then we'll have a little Q&A with some of our favorite youth organizers, Dakota Hall and Amanda Avalos, before our donor organizing team wraps it all up with what you can do right now to support this work. Um, but before we get into it, I just wanted to remind you that in order to win, the groups that are doing this work on our behalf need us to invest. Early money is best, so thank you for all of those that have given already, but if you haven't given yet or think that you can give again, money today can still be used. Use the, yeah, thank you. There's a donate link on the screen. Please use that. Go to our website, reach out to us. Let us know how we can support you in getting these groups the resources they need. And in this final stretch, I think it's gonna show up on the screen right now. Um, here's where MVP's priorities are. It is retain governing power in the US Senate and House, prevent or eliminate Republican trifectas in 2024 presidential swing states, and win statewide elected offices in key states with the power to advance and protect on key issues. So to introduce our first speaker, I am very excited to introduce you all to Latasha D. Mays, who is running for Pennsylvania State House. Uh, Latasha is the founder and former president of president and CEO of New Voices for Reproductive Justice, which is an MVP partner. It's an incredible organization founded in Pittsburgh in 2004 that's now expanded throughout Pennsylvania and into Ohio as a political home for Black women, femmes, girls, and gender, gender expansive folks. She was so good at advocating for folks that they asked her to run for office, and we're lucky that she is. As an organizer herself, Latasha knows firsthand how important movement building is to affecting change. So we wanted to give you the opportunity to hear from her directly. Thank you so much, Latasha. Good evening, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Latasha D. Mays. I use she, her pronouns. I have the distinct honor of founding New Voices for Reproductive Justice. And I want to just take a moment to thank MVP for its many years of su support, directing and diverting important financial resources to true grassroots organizing that uh, was that was instrumental in, in organizing, mobilizing, turning out and developing the leadership of Black women, femmes, girls, and gender expansive folks, not only in elections in Pennsylvania and Ohio, but also in critical fights on the ground in our local communities. So I wanna especially thank Billy and Katie for uh, their, their years of hard work and bringing investments into new voices. 
Uh, though I'm no longer the leadership of New Voices for Reproductive Justice, uh, the, the work and movement that uh, for me, I had a chance for the last 18 years to be a part of an incredible national, international movement uh, for reproductive justice, uh, a movement that was created by 12 Black women in 1994. They coined the term reproductive justice. And it, this movement is transformational, it's, it's powerful, and it, it has set the stage for this moment in my life. And I carry the movement for reproductive justice in any and everything I do, not when I'm just, when I was leading an organization, but for my current uh, reality and my next chapter as, uh, as a rep state representative here in Pennsylvania for in-house district 24 in Pittsburgh. And so it has been a full journey. And what I wanna start by saying is that there's no way that I win a democratic primary as the political outsider, as the party outsider, without grassroots organizing as the key, as the key strategy in my race. Um, I really grappled when I thought about running for office, this is my third time running. Uh, I last ran for city council in 2015 the more philosophical questions that have come up in terms of electoral and community organizing is this idea of who gets to lead, who is electable, and who can actually win. So, you know, though you may have many years of service to your community, uh, deep and meaningful relationships in your community, personally and professionally, and in your networks, you can have really done remarkable things, but our political systems and our parties, our two-party system especially, doesn't always see people like me, a black woman, an out lesbian, someone who identifies as masculine of center, a reproductive justice organizer, unapologetic about abortion access as a good candidate. And that is just absolutely absurd. And so if we listen to that, we wouldn't run. If we listen to you know, the political insiders, we wouldn't think that we would have the support of our community. And so while I ran a grueling race this, this past year, a very hard fought victory um, in May, it would not have been possible without grassroots organizing, grassroots support. And so, when we think about who gets to lead, when we think about who gets to participate in our democracy, we have to think of all people, of all backgrounds, of all walks of life, uh, of all identities, and we have to see them as leaders. When we, and more importantly, we have to see ourselves as leaders. And what I've learned from my over 20 plus years of organizing and leading in the nonprofit and being a policy advocate at the state level primarily, but also at the local level in three cities in Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Philadelphia, and as a federal policy advocate. We have to know that we belong in any every, every room where decisions are being made about our community, where decisions are being made about our, our families, where decisions are being made about our bodies. We deserve to be there. We're not waiting for anyone to ask us for to ask us to lead, to ask us to vote, to ask us to run. We are taking our rightful place in our democracy. And Black women are the core, the foundation, the backbone. We are the soul of the American electorate outperforming every segment. And so I am so proud of the work of New Voices for the last 18 years and really the last decade of turning out hundreds of thousands of black women voters in Pennsylvania and Ohio to the polls over the years and being instrumental in our presidential election victory where the votes came down to Philadelphia County and Allegheny County, places that New Voices has worked uh, going back to at least 2016. And so I, had, I could go on and say more and I'll just say one more thing that for me, grassroots organizing brought me to this political moment where for me as a reproductive justice organizer, I'm a person that has fought for abortion access for decades. 
and to have the opportunity to serve the people of Pennsylvania, uh, to serve women and folks who need abortions across this Commonwealth, to have the, that opportunity right now to walk into the state capital of Pennsylvania and fight against constitutional bans as and at the same time fight for expanded access to abortion care. I can't think of a better time, a better place or a better opportunity than now. So I encourage you to please support the work of MVP. Uh, please support the work of grassroots organizers, especially reproductive justice organizers on the ground, black women specifically hard, who are doing the work every day to protect not only our reproductive freedoms, but also our democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Latasha. That was so powerful. And thank you so much for taking time out. I know it's a really busy time for you and we are we are rooting for you. Um, next, uh, you know, you talked a bit about opportunity and that's what our next speaker is here to talk about. What are the opportunities? Uh, so Jama Bickley King is currently Chief Solutions Officer for Target Smart, a political data company that helps organizations persuade, target, and get out the vote for progressive issues and candidates. He has over two decades of experience in progressive data and technology, and he is also a co-founder of New Virginia Majority, another MVP partner. Um, so I'm going to let Jamal talk. Drop questions in the chat for Jamal as you have them. He's going to address them as, as he gets them. Thanks. Thanks, Jamal. Uh, thank you so much for uh, that wonderful introduction. My name is Jamal Bickley King. I'm the Chief Solutions Officer. You can see how old that picture was, clearly from the beard and the gray there. Um, but yes, I am looking forward to getting this thing started. Uh, I will be kind of going over some of the things that we are seeing in the data. None of these things are conclusive. They are not predictive, but these are the, what we can draw from some of our analysis and what we've seen so far. So in 2018 versus 2022, um, at, the, at 15 weeks out from election day, registration can continue to slightly outpace uh, 2018, which is, you know, kind of understood as we kind of move forward. Um, we have by about almost like a around, you know, about 600, 700,000 votes. Um, it could have been a lot of issues. It is actually pretty fine. And I think it's okay. Uh, voters of color continue to grow as a share of the electorate. Um, and through the voter registration improvements and modeling, women Voters of color make up a larger share of the registrants in 2022 than in 2018. Particularly, like the most impressive is the AAPI community literally doubling the number of uh, registered people, uh, which I think is amazing. And Latinos continue to grow at a rapid clip, whereas African Americans are around steady state. Uh, the Democratic registration advantage continues. Uh, almost 700,000 more newly registered Democrats than Republicans nationwide, only slightly off of what we see at this point in 2018. Um, and then there's the post Dobbs registration bump, uh, which is that we see it in some places and some places more difficult, but in Pennsylvania, it was pretty clear uh, a gain, a 13% in gain, a 13% gain in model Democratic voter registration. 7% uh, gain in uh, female voter registration, and then gain in under 35 registration, which is a traditional Democratic uh, supporters for the most part at 8%. Uh, the 2022 landscape in congressional districts, uh, there are about 58 congressional districts rated lean or toss up in 2022. In those districts, 15 million are voters of color, single women, and young voters. Uh, the pro Progressive coalition must show up in 2022. Of course, those uh, voters of color, single women, and young voters make up a majority of the electorate in 35 of those 58 swing districts. And, like, you know, as the West goes, so goes the country, with Arizona, California, Nevada, Colorado, Texas containing 15 of those toss up districts where single women, young, young people, and voters of color make up a majority share of the electorate. Uh, total black voters in swing districts um, in those states, as you can see, is the usual suspects, North Carolina, Virginia, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, Nevada, New York, 
uh, they have like some of the largest critical masses of uh, African Americans in those swing congressional districts. Uh, total youth voters in swing districts, again, um, as you know, the highly populous states tend to like have more of those, California, New York, and then Michigan, Oregon, Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, kind of rounding out the rest. These also are usual suspects, but these are places where uh, youth engagement could be key. And then total Hispanic voters within the swing congressionals, again, uh, California, Texas, Florida, Nevada, New York, New Mexico, Arizona. There's no real uh, surprise there, but definitely uh, investment in those areas can definitely make a difference for a lot of the places. Uh, get out the vote remains critical. Uh, many new voters within these swing districts entered in the electorate in 2018 and 2020, especially within communities of color. Almost 30% of the progressive coalition in these swing CDs were newly mobilized in 2018 and 2020. Which is actually, but we have to keep that momentum. This is where GOTV comes in to help mobilize and maintain these voters, uh, maintain these new voters of color to be active voters moving forward. Um, here's the progressive coalition assessment in Arizona. Uh, the congressional districts that are competitive will be CD1, 2, and 6. Uh, as you can see, there's total youth voters of over 300,000. Total single women, close to 400,000 registered voters. Total people of color is 28,900. And 51% of those people are uh, the coalition. Similarly, you have the same uh, coalitions in CD3, 7, and 8, uh, with 500 youth voters, 500 total single women, people of color, coming up 53% of the coalition. And then you have uh, Nevada with CD1, 3, and 4 with uh, large critical masses of 370,000 some odd youth voters, 344,000 some odd single women voters, and total people color 517, with 65% um, of, of the uh, coalition. And then similar in North Carolina, where CD1 and 13, with those youth voters in those districts of being at 237,000, 250,000 uh, single women, total people color uh, 300,000-ish. And that's it. Thanks, Jama. A couple of questions for you. So one very specific question related to a New York Times article that came out the other day discussing a poll that showed Republicans were gaining in key demographics, uh, such as independent women, on messaging around inflation and the economy, which are seen as more motivating than abortion. How would you respond to that? Well, it's, it's one poll with not a huge sample. Uh, New York Times are good pollsters, and every poll at this point should be considered a snapshot of what could happen if turnout matches their likely voter sample. This New York Times poll, the likely voter sample was particularly conservative. If the GOP beats us on turnout to that extent, then the New York Times poll will be accurate. Uh, for the people freaking out about the women independents won 36 points bit, it was irresponsible of Nate to include that in his analysis. That's a subgroup that likely included somewhere around 100 respondents. So we're talking a margin of error somewhere close to double digits. And for the no gender gap believers, I have a hard time buying that Republicans will have record vote share uh, support from women just months after every woman lost a fundamental human right. And, you know, the, the too long, you know, didn't read version is I wouldn't worry about it all that much. Um, and then one more question. I, so looking at the data, I'd love for you to tell us what gives you hope. Let's start with what scares you, what scares you about the data, and then what gives you hope about the data? Uh, what scares me about the data is that this only works with a heavy amount of resourcing. And the conversation about this year is where they're gonna try and put it on women, people of color and youth not coming out is the reason that if we have any losses whatsoever, it's more like it's, it's a conversation about the resourcing and how we had significant foundations and entities kind of check out this year. And you know, politics is all about the setup. And I'm worried that we didn't have enough resources to capitalize on the newly activated women and these women who are like totally fired up and they have a on-ramp for them to go into the organizing. Have we invested in 
the last week of the election so that we can go ahead and turn on the machine and maintain the velocities that we need to win to have enough people to come out and vote. And because those things have not happened in, at the levels that we've done previously, it does worry me a considerable amount. Um, the thing that gives me hope is that even with all that said, at least in the early returns of the voter work, is that there's definitely a significant increase in uh, voter attention. The margins are high. We just don't know if that uh, momentum can be maintained the whole time through. And will those margins maintain as we move forward? And that's unknown to us. But the early returns look somewhat positive. And I don't know if that link got dropped in chat yet, but there's a link that Target Smart launched a website today for early votes. So someone will yeah. be dropping that link in chat so you all can follow. Um, thank you so much, Jama. That was super. I, I think someone wrote it in chat and I just want to reiterate that this, this is all, uh, what does Zakia say? She said something around, you made it plain for us. What your numbers show us is that we have the numbers to win. We just need to invest more. So thank you so much, Jama. Um, yeah. And next, I am thrilled to introduce you all to Katie Sipp. So Katie's been with MVP since 2019 as our Pennsylvania State Advisor. She's an organizer who works with grassroots groups involved in immigrant and labor rights organizing. She's also the founder of the Pennsylvania Affiliate of Working Families Party and has worked for and with a number of other Pennsylvania organizations. Katie, we would love to hear from you a couple of highlights on the work happening in Pennsylvania, especially in light of the opportunity that Jama spoke about. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so a couple of things first. Uh, I just want to thank all of the folks who have already donated so far this year. Your early support, as Jama spoke about, is incredibly was incredibly important. And, you know, in some ways, like we always are in this moment where, you know, people are kind of interested in spending money in the last three, four weeks of a campaign. But MVB donors who donated early this year really helped build the critical infrastructure of the kind of uh, thing that Jamal was speaking about. And, you know, to some degree, um, that is what's going to be what carries us over the finish line this year in Pennsylvania, for sure. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to Latasha, uh, who I met, I first met when I started working for MVP in 2019. She's an incredible badass. She's about to be, I think you are gonna be only the second black woman elected to the state legislature from the city of Pittsburgh ever, which is kind of embarrassing, but it's equally, what is equally embarrassing is that we are also about to elect the first black woman to Congress from the state of Pennsylvania. Not embarrassing in that it is happening, but embarrassing in that it has taken until 2022 to do that. And so the two things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit tonight are some last minute uh, needs that groups in Pennsylvania have because of things that have been happening in the election earlier this year. So uh, the person who's going to win uh, and become the first Black woman congresswoman from the state, Summer Lee, is currently in a district that is, uh, you know, has been historically a safe Democratic district. The Republicans are spending a ton of money against her, and they're not just spending it directly in the race to defeat Summer Lee, they're also spending it in another adj adjacent congressional race where a guy named Chris Deluzio is running to replace Connor Lamb. And so recent, I was recently in Pittsburgh um, talking to one of the MVP par partners there, Brandy Fisher, who is the director of the Alliance for Police Accountability, IEPAC. Um, Brandy herself has been featured in a dark money GOP ad against Deluzio. Not, but an ad that also used pictures of Summer Lee as, you know, it was really a kind of racist dog whistle ad that was designed to gin up fears about crime by saying that, you know, Black women who are organizing to keep their children from being murdered by the police officers are somehow responsible for an increase in crime. And obviously that is a thing that groups in Pittsburgh are standing up very strong against. So there are currently independent expenditure efforts that are being run by some of the MVP groups, um, including Pennsylvania United, uh, th their PAC, um, the uh, Working Families Party PAC, and also the Alliance for Police Accountability's IE PAC. And so it's critically important. I mean, this, this is not a race where we thought we were going to have to spend a bunch of money, but we are spending money. And the other sort of 
specific dynamic that's happening in that race is that the Republicans decided to run someone who has the same name of the outgoing retiring Democratic congressman. So it has taken a little bit to convince Pittsburgh voters, no, this is a different Mike Doyle than the one that you've been voting for for the past 20 years. This Mike Doyle is a Republican, don't vote for that guy, vote for Summer instead. So folks who are interested uh, obviously should, you know, check out the uh, news stories about this. Um, there's been a lot of good reporting in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, but uh, there are still sort of last minute, you know, financial needs that groups have to be able to push back on this kind of unexpected attack. The other thing that I wanna talk about a little bit tonight is um, an effort that another uh, black led group in Pennsylvania is doing, Power in Action, which is a faith-based group. It's the C4 arm of the faith-based group. They have just this week kicked off a bus tour against Christian nationalism, where they are uh, taking a you know, bus of clergy from Philadelphia to cities across the state. Uh, this week, they're going to Allentown, Bethlehem, Scranton, Washington, Pittsburgh, and Harrisburg to talk about the fact in faith communities that you know Christian nationalism is something that has to be fought against. It has to be fought against in their churches, and it also has to be fought against in the in the their the voting booth. And we have a Christian nationalist running for governor right now, so that's a pretty timely message for Pennsylvania voters to hear. Uh, so I'm going to stop and you know just make sure that folks have time to do the donor organizing that is so important. But um, so happy to be here. Happy to talk or answer questions about Pennsylvania in the chat if folks have them. Thanks. Thanks so much, Katie. And yeah, if folks have questions, please drop them in the chat and people will answer questions in the chat as well. Um, next, we're going to talk to some of our uh, the youth organizers that I mentioned earlier. So I want to introduce them and then we'll ask them a few questions. Uh, first, Amanda Avalos is co-executive director of Leaders Igniting Transformation, also known as LIT, a youth of color-led organization that builds political power in Wisconsin. LIT was a major success story of 2020 when they ran the largest youth voter outreach campaign in the state. Their organizing victories include terminating the contracts between Milwaukee Public Schools and the Milwaukee Police Department, fighting the school-to-prison uh, school and deportation pipelines. It's a reminder that we first and foremost have to engage with people on the issues. That's what gets people to turn out. And then we'll also be talking to Dakota Hall, who's actually the founding executive director of LIT, where he led the organization for the first four years of growth and expansion, and was an integral part of the Alliance for Youth Action, where he is now the first black and indigenous leader to take the helm of that organization. Dakota started out as a student organizer and was instrumental to the successes and expansion of LIT. He's been at the Alliance for almost a year, leading the nation's largest network of youth-led organizations dedicated to building year-round power with an emphasis on BIPOC leadership. Um, so first, I'd love to start with a question that I'd like both of you to answer. So Jama and the folks at Target Smart have shown here with data what you both have been saying and have known for years, that we have huge opportunities with the youth vote. How does what he just discussed compare with what you're seeing on the ground? Yeah, I'll take this. Um, so Dakota, he, him pronouns um, with the Alliance Youth Action. We are a network of um, powerful youth organizations that represent 20 organizations in 18 different states, including Michigan, where I'm at right now, um, knocking doors as we have sent our staff across the country to ensure that the youth vote is turned out and that staff are participating and actively making sure that um, young people are supported. And what we're seeing on the ground, I think, is a is a beautiful story, right? Like Target Smart data shows us that we're seeing an increase in the youth vote, early early youth vote, in key places like Florida, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and so many more, right? And and that's critical to the landscape of what in which we're at right now, and where we've seen so many um, attacks on voting rights over the last few years, right? And since 2020, almost. 8 million young people have become eligible to register to vote, right? And almost half of those people um, are young people of color, meaning that once again, Gen Z and millennials are gonna keep turning the page to make this electorate the most diverse electorate that we've seen in our country's history, right? And the reason they're gonna do that is because youth organizations like LIT, like Detroit Action, like Poder down in uh, uh, Phoenix, 
are ensuring that young people have the resources to be mobilized, right? And that is a year round spectrum that must be funded. And that includes one on ones, that includes voter registration, that, turn, that includes turnout, right? And it also means that you can't just leave young people to hang after the election, right? The, the, the leadership model must continue the day after the election because we know right after the election, we go on to legislative fights to really build power to make sure that laws are not discriminatory against our communities, right? And so, Again, like what one of the things I, I truly do believe is that young people are the superheroes of democracy, right? In 2018, we saw them avenge democracy after Trump winning in 2016. In 2020, we saw them be the guardians of democracy by ensuring that he does not get reelected. And what we're going to see in 2022 is the age of youth, as many young people now who are eligible to register to vote are making their democracy debut by turning out and voting. Thank you. And yes, really driving home that point about it is not just about election day. It is about what's happening after election day as well. Um, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thank you for the invitation um, for like to participate in this conversation. It's an honor and especially for the conversation uh, to be held with our former founding ED Dakota. So thank you again. Um, Amanda pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm one of the interim co-executive directors at LIT. Um, and LIT is a, an organization that builds independent uh, power, political power for, with, and for young Black and brown people in the state of Wisconsin. We build homegrown leadership, we expand access and opportunity, and we promote an equitable society by engaging and organizing the leadership of young people. Um, so I think in, in summation for me, young people, young voters in particular are powerful. Um, like Dakota was mentioning, especially in states like Wisconsin, where in 2020, young voters were the deciding factor for the state's presidential pick when he when he won by a margin of barely 21,000 votes. Um, that's small, but that's also major, right? We lit focuses on values-based issue relational and electoral organizing year round. Year round, we're investing in young people via our leadership development programming, our civic engagement and democracy work. We advocate for the issues that young people care about. I think the opportunity, um, just like the youth energy has always been there, um, and we are getting young people registered to vote, not just registered to vote, but making sure that they have the most updated information about how to, for example, mail back their absentee ballots, how to early vote, how to show up at the polls, knowing that they have the option to register to vote on election day. Um, and an another example of that is that LIT members also created the only youth vote voter guide in the state this year. So it's gonna be a resource that will be mailed to over 73,000 young people across the state on Monday. Um, and we know that you know voting is just a tool, right? It's not it's not the entire formula. It's uh, it's not enough to just to register voters, not to make sure that people are voting, but to make sure that they're equipped with uh, information that they need to make informed choices, right? Um, and that's for people who are eligible to vote and otherwise. Um, I think like Jama and others mentioned earlier, we have the ability to win, right? And it's gonna what it's gonna take is that deep and continued investment in year round civic engagement work, political education. Um, so that when election season does come around, we're already ready, right? We have the, the base of young people who are active, who are engaged, who will vote, and who will mobilize their families, their schools, and their communities. Um, someone said it in the chat, and it just popped up for me. Youth leaders are amazing, and absolutely. Uh, Dakota, question for you around the student debt campaign that I know Alliance has been running. Um, how is that playing out in the States? How are you seeing that motivating people? Yeah. I mean, I think to answer this question, let's get into a time machine, right? Because I think what's important is to understand that this did not just happen this year. If we take it back 10 years ago, right? Um, I can speak to the lens of Dakota as a freshman in college, getting introduced to the wonderful world of youth organizing and student organizing, getting introduced to organizations like United Council of UW Students, getting introduced to organizations like United States Student Association, USSA, and countless of other statewide student organizations who are working on this very same issue 10 years ago, right? And so what we've seen is this is what, this is what happens when you invest in the long-term movement building organizing that not just develops leaders, but develops issues for the long term. And we have to continuously focus on not just the present day victories, but what can we win 10 years from now, right? And so what we're seeing on the ground is the fruits of the labor of decades of student organizers who fought for this issue for so many years, finally getting this hum humongous win, right? And that doesn't mean we're gonna stop right here, but we have to evaluate what the next steps are to ensure that we're uh, um, making college more affordable, right? Young people have bought into 
a broken system that allows them to take on too much debt to achieve and hire uh, a piece of paper that is supposed to allow them economic mobility to help break generational curses. But often what we've seen is higher, ed higher education institutions prey on um, women, prey on communities of color. And that's why we have a disparity in student loan debt. And we have to make sure that the system stops right here, right? On the ground, young people are not just one issue voters as well too, right? Like while they're excited about student loan debt relief and this has been able to provide them so many benefits to their mental health, right? Economic factors of them knowing, not knowing they can go buy a new car to think about a home now, that young people care about that and everything else. Young people are intersectional. Young people um, have held the line on saying, you know what, we will not take this deal unless you are taking other considerations as well too, right? We've seen that with econo economic bills and environmental bills, even this this year. So it's not just student loan debt that has young people riled up. Abortion has young people riled up. The climate crisis has people, young people riled up. Police brutality has it, uh, young people riled up. And so what we're seeing is a coalition of young people who care about their very specific issue all coming together and saying, we can build a new world that actually values us, right? To ensure that the generations of millennials, Gen Zs, Gen Alphas, Gen Betas, and, and those who come after them live in a world that their ancestors are proud of. Such a good point about the intersectionality of the issues. Like it's way more than one issue that they're working on. Um, Amanda, question for you. So Wisconsin has had above average youth turnout in recent elections, which has been a decisive factor in democratic wins. What is LIT seeing? And tell us about some of the work you're doing to engage and turn out these voters. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. So I mentioned that year round we uh, we educate, we engage, we mobilize young people, young voters and voters of color who have consistently been left behind in, at the policy level, right? We um, are working hard to get young people registered to collect pledge cards uh, from young voters through, you know, various events on campuses and community events uh, via our Canvas. Two weeks ago, we held our, we hosted our second ever statewide action gathering where our membership of about almost 100 college students uh, from around the state came together to learn about issues, receive um, organizing electoral and leadership development training. Um, we also had the chance to canvas in Milwaukee together. And after a fun day of knocking just over 5,000 doors in Milwaukee, we had the chance to essentially test run what the next three weeks are going to look like for, for the team, right? And we were out in the community just having conversations with young voters, voters of color, um, voters in neighborhoods where they are typically not canvas. So um, the neighborhoods that have the highest number of young people in the city and also the lowest historical voter turnout. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, we know that elections are not the only way for young people to make their voices heard on the issues that they care about most. Um, I mentioned that we run that year round programming to educate, engage and empower young people to be politically active um, throughout the year in their schools, communities and across the state and their college campuses as well. Um, what are we seeing? We're seeing that young people are ready to lead, right? We're building their leadership so that in moments like these of mobilization and turnout that we're ready. Um, and for example, this past spring, we had to turn into uh, rapid response mode when there were over 100 extremely problematic anti-voter um, bills being heard at the assembly level, right? We had all, all hands on deck deal, everybody go up, drive up to Madison and give testimony in front of committees. So it's an example of like, you know, when, when our base is ready and trained, we're, we're ready for whatever's needed in the moment. So that includes election seasons. Um, and given all of our work on the ground, uh, we anticipate that young people are going to continue to turn out in a big way for the midterms um, because issues that they care about and to speak to the question that we received in the chat, um, the issues that they care about that are on the ballot, right? So particularly student loan debt, climate change, abortion rights, inflation, gun control, criminal justice, public safety, just to name a few, healthcare for all, um, all those things are showing up in the ballot, right? And they're not in the form of a candidate because we haven't historically endorsed candidates, but we're big on issues advocacy work, right? And um, young people understand the issues that are on our ballot because the people that they're electing uh, on their ballots have governance and to be able to make decisions about those issues that affect themselves, their families, the communities, people around them. Um, so again, as the you know largest youth led organization in the state, we're seeing firsthand how passionate and committed young people are to creating that change. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate and underscore what both of you have been saying, Katie said, Shema said about year round organizing and year round money and how important it is that it doesn't happen just in an election year and that budgets and don't go down in an off year. It is so important to fund year round organizing if we want the electoral wins. Um, one final thing from both of you, 
tell us a story from the ground, something that's happened that has you really excited and hopeful, not just for this election, but for the future more generally. And either one of you can go first. I can start this time. Um, it's hard to pick just one story. Uh, I think that there's nothing like a good canvassing story and we just have so many. We have, we've had a canvas team knocking doors um, in Milwaukee since the middle of the summer with the goal of 100,000 doors, um, confident that we're gonna just suppress that very soon. Um, we're hearing a lot of, you know, of course I'll be voting at this time. You know, I know what's at stake. Um, and I think this is because we've done a couple loops in our universe. So I mean, this is not the first time we've had a conversation with them. After a couple of times of knocking on the door, having a the conversation, they're getting to know us, right? They've had the, the spiel about, you know, getting registered to vote. We've talked about the issues, their understanding that like, we're here to say this is a serious thing this is coming up and they know uh to vote and you know what's what's at stake really um we're getting a lot of folks who like have just moved into the new place they didn't realize that they had the option to vote if they had just moved um it's halloween so we're getting a lot of uh scary porches i'm hearing <laughs> uh in terms of like halloween decorations and stuff but i think all of those interactions always come with um those are the best kind of interactions right you have something to uh you know, having commonality with folks. But I think my favorite story lately has been, there was one porch where um, two of our canvassers were able to get a voter registration at the door. At the same time, they were able to save two kittens <laughs> that were stuck and almost freezing on the porch. The person who lived there was deathly scared of cats. So she had been avoiding going in and out through her front door and kind of just avoiding the situation. Um, so our canvassers did both um, the voter registration, collect the pledge, and also ended up saving two baby kittens. Um, and I think that just speaks to like, this is, this is so much more than just getting the metric of, you know, getting the voter registration. This speaks to like the story behind these things. And I think young people in particular do the, do such a good job at hum humanizing the work, right? And like, just keeping us grounded in the fact that like, we're going to find joy in all of this, yes, it's it's hard and it's getting cold in Milwaukee. We're knocking doors. We're having the same conversation over and over. It's not always received well, but sometimes it is. Um, young people are going to continue to find that joy in the work, and that's honestly what keeps me hopeful in all this. I love that it's we're a community. Yeah, so we'll knock on your door, but we'll also help you with your cats. Uh, Dakota. Yeah, um, let me take y'all to Phoenix, Arizona, right, and and talk about an amazing, incredible young woman, Jennifer Hernandez, who grew up in in the Phoenix area, who went to Phoenix schools and was an organizer at a very young age against Sheriff Apayo to stop the deportations, to fight against all the incredible, cruel laws that we've seen Arizona try to implement and pass over the last decade, targeted towards brown immigrants uh, and refugees seeking asylum in our country. Jennifer um, decided to run for school board um, this year, and Jennifer won that school board election, right, showing the power that young people have when they own the fact that they can not only impact elections, but they can also run in these elections and be elected, right? And to me, what that shows that we have a generational wave coming of young leaders who can take over school boards, who can take over city councils, who can take over county boards and begin to learn how to govern. So that way, by the time they're ready to run for Congress, to run for Senate, we have champions from the movement, right? And let me repeat that champions from the movement, right? It's not just enough to continuously settle for candidates, but if we wanna live and build the world that we want to have, where abortion access is accessible and free to individuals, where K through 12 education is funded so that way no child is left behind, where we have a edu higher education system where no one is burdened with tens of thousands of dollars of debt seeking that, we have to begin to run candidates, right? And so for me, the feel good story is knowing that young leaders like Jennifer across the country are running and winning in their local elections. And Jennifer is the youngest woman on the school board now in Phoenix is one of the largest school boards we have in this country. And I think it once again, just I have to keep pointing this back. It's like, Yes, federal elections matter. And that's actually like probably why we're all here tonight is because we see people like Dr. Oz almost close to the US Senate. And we're tired of TV characters pretending to run our government, right? And so while we've seen the failures of federal government and even state governments, young people are really showing us that they are energized, that they are ready to mobilize and organize their communities, not just for this election, but for 24, 26, 28. And I'm gonna have a Dean Howard moment and yeehaw to 32, right? 
because when the failures of local or, or when the failures of federal government happen, young people are finding victories locally. Uh, thank you both so much, Amanda and Dakota, and thank you everyone that this, I, it has been such an honor to have you all on the call. Latasha, Dakota, Amanda, Jama, Katie, it just gives me so much hope for what's possible. Uh, I'm going to pass off hosting duties to Billy now, so Billy's going to come back and uh, host for the rest of the call. Thank you all. This was just so inspiring. Thank you, Cindy. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> Not only are they winning the elections, they're also saving baby kittens. Like you can't, you can't do any better than that. Um, and we're we're actually really on time. So if we have a little bit of time, um, might try to, uh, if Dakota or Amanda, if you're still around, <laughs> ask you uh, one last question at the end. So, um, but I have the pleasure of introducing my friend Becky Liebman, who. It's so cool. I think this might be your first time talking on a national MVP call. Becky and I, you know, Becky is like supporting MVP back in the very early days. And we, we got to talking with her and her friend, um, Sally, um, and they, Sally Goodwin. And, and I was like, we were starting the, the, the Western Mass team was starting and the Eastern Mass local team was starting. And, and I was like, hey, Becky um, and, and Sally, you guys wouldn't want to start a team in Washington State, would you? And they were like, I don't know. And they talked and like, next thing you know, they started a Washington State team that has just kept going, all volunteers. You know, I think they have like something like 10 core members now. And they've organized dozens of events and they just, they're just an amazing team. And they're a mock, you know, and Becky's like, oh, we're just a little team. We're not like Massachusetts that, you know, is so big. And it's like, no, you guys are, are potentially a model that could be replicated all over the country. It was just, um, so anyway, I'm going to pass it to Becky. Um, it's so great to have you on and thank you so much to you and Sally and the whole Washington state team for all the incredible work you all have done. Um, it's just really a leading light in the country. Oh, thank you, Billy. Thank you for that. And <clears throat> wow, we are in some very, very good company tonight. Um, uh, Latasha, Jama, Katie, Amanda, Dakota, you guys are real rock stars and I'm honored to be with you. And uh, forgive me if my voice sounds a little hoarse. I live in Washington State and we've had many smoky days out here. Uh, and that sad fact um, sort of helps set the stage for tonight. Okay, I'm so glad and grateful to be here for the last 30 years. I've been obsessed with learning how to best use resources to uh, positively impact the world. And I can tell you with a full and happy heart that in this moment of time, Movement Voter Project most closely reflects my values and the strategies that I believe can get us toward those values. Yesterday, while washing dishes, I listened to a podcast. Uh, it was an episode of The Daily, <clears throat> and it was about a camp for children called Fear Facers Camp. Fear Facer Camp. Just think of that. Children so beset with anxiety, they need to go to a Fear Facers Camp. So I stopped washing my dishes and I just listened to the eight year old girl describe her own journey <clears throat> to overcome her fears. And she's not alone. Headlines are telling us that fear and anxiety are dramatically on the rise for kids. Well, that is not a world that I want for these kids. I want a world where our kids, grandkids, all children can grow up feeling confident in their futures and confident in us. And I want adults to feel confident too. I want resilient local communities with strong safety nets, strong connective tissue among us. And I want a government that will include diverse voices at the table 
to allow the myriads of solutions we're going to need to solve our problems. And in order for that to happen, we need to continue to act now to strengthen our democracy. And this is what MVP has to offer to us a way to narrow our focus and do what we can do. Given the best data, the best people, you heard some of them tonight, and the best targeted strategies and ongoing year round organizing. Is it too late to give? Absolutely not. Movement Voter PAC is getting money out to groups in the fields twice a week. As soon as money comes in, it gets it out. And though that money goes to pay for the GOTV campuses, the supplies, the transportation, and the money will also go to the essential post-election work to make sure that every single ballot, every, every single ballot, ballot is counted and to be ready for some uh, inevitable uh, runoffs and court challenges. And I don't need to tell you the margins like they were in 2020 will be very, very slim. So in these unprecedented times, I've started making my own unprecedented donations beginning back in 2018. And I have increased annually ever since. And even though I pride myself on giving early, Katie, I did it. I started in January this year. I find myself still giving more, even now, even tonight, because it's what I can do. So if you're on the fence or doubt that we can make this, try this. Imagine that our problem is not only our opposition, it's not only ignorance or greed. Imagine that our problem is also our own fear and cynicism our own failure of nerve. I invite you to take the risk of truly believing that turning the tide with this election is possible. And why not? Why not believe that? Wins have happened throughout history under enormous, often impossible odds. The labor movement, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the movement for LGBTQ rights. All of these wins have expanded our imagination of what's possible. I often hear the question, have I done, have you done everything you can? Well, <clears throat> to me, the more helpful question is this. Am I growing every day, including today, to be bigger, bolder, braver, to help build the world I want to see in the future? I'm talking to myself right now, as much as I'm talking to you when I say, let us grow our own courage and commitment to match these times, to, to honor these kids that Dakota and Amanda told us about. Let us nourish and embolden our friends to do the same as donors and as volunteers. It is not too late to give in 2020 for the first time or the umpteenth time and to face our fears arm in arm, our own fear facers camp in the best of company. Please join me in giving tonight and give with me again next year. This is what we can do. Thanks so much, back to you, Billy. Oh my God, we got fear facers camp, we got saving <laughs> kittens, oh my God. This is so beautiful. Oh my God. And this is, you know, just to zoom out, here we all are. There's 129 of us on the call. And, you know, yeah, we're all going to do everything we can. We're going to donate. Everyone should donate if you can donate again. You know, if you can spread the word, um, you know, there's there's a, if you go to the movement.vote website, there's a there's a really cool way to to volunteer, to just let your people know about this. Um, there, we're all going to do those things, but at a deeper level, we're building community with each other. Like we are, you know, you might not know Dakota and Amanda and Katie personally and, and Latasha, you know, and, 
but but now you know them a little bit and one day you'll be at a conference and you'll meet them and you'll be like oh and you know we're building a community that is that is what is like really needed the the, the deeper thing that's needed to to transform this world and you know 20 days from now we're going to we're going to look at the test results as they come in we're all going to be glued to you know we're either going to be looking at cnn like this or we're going to be refreshing 538 like this and and we're going to get the results and as becky said you know it's going to be close we're going to lose some races by a thousand votes we're going to win some races by a thousand votes and our job is to help as many groups as possible to win the races by a thousand votes instead of losing them by a thousand votes. And I just actually got a text while we're on this call, like, do you have another $25,000 to expand our, our program? Like organizers right now, like, yes, early money is, is by far the best. And there's so much late money that's also needed right now. Um, so it really does make a difference. The kind of conversations that we're having with organizers right now is they're like, you know, um, can you get us that 25,000? And then we're like, ah, we can't get it to you right away. Could you take it if we get it to you in a month, you know, and they're like, could, could you float it? These are the kind of conversations that are happening all over the, the movement right now to try to scrap things together to run the biggest programs we can to, to, to make it work. And so anything that you can do, any way that you can spread the word, put it on your Facebook, send an email to your friends, you know, talk to your, your parent or your, you know, cousin who you haven't talked to and just be like, Hey, I'm doing this. You know, this video uh, will come out in the next day or so. We're going to send you a really great newsletter. We just put together with this and some other inspiring videos. You can just send it on to people. Um, we, we're, I'm, I'm personally trying to call 50 people a week right now. I'm calling people who gave $250 four years ago and been like, Hey, <laughs> can you, can you, you know, chip in again? We miss you, you know? So th this is, this is what we're all called to do in our own way, you know? And, and some people are introverts and, you know, might feel more comfortable writing an email, we all got to do what we can. And so that when we're watching that screen refreshing, we will we will feel like, okay, we did everything we could to help Amanda as the results are coming in in Wisconsin. So um, that's the basic gist. And I, I want to actually, um, Dakota and Amanda, if you're, if you're still here, this is kind of unplanned, but just want to ask what you're thinking about in the last 20 days, you know, what your groups are thinking about. And then after the election, we're going to have a call the day after the election, the afternoon of November 9th. And we're going to hear from organizers from the states, you know, to interpreting the results in real time. Some of them will, will still be counted. And then we're going to start the next chapter, which is about getting people, to, you know, we did pretty good under the circumstances in 2022. But the truth is, we really should have should have moved twice as much money collectively as we did to the field. And we should have moved it twice as early. Like we would not be like wondering if we're gonna lose these elections now if we had if we had done that. And so we really gotta learn the lessons from this and and do 2023 right, you know, so that these groups have every resource they have to do everything they can possibly do so that we're not we're not worried in 2024 no matter what happens so um so amanda and dakota just want to give you guys the last word you you give us all so much hope thank you for everything you do every day and anything that we can do to organize everyone we know to support your work and to support the work of so many incredible organizers like you is the least we can do and so just want to give you the last word on how you're thinking about the the final stretch. Yeah, I mean, how I'm thinking about the final stretch is putting myself into the field for the next three weeks, ensuring that I am doing everything I can do um, in my job, as well as making sure that I am calling voters, that I am knocking those doors, right, Billy, like to ensure that it's all hands on deck at this moment, right? Um, and not just like just for this election, but to ensure that 
the organizers and the directors in the Alliance Network understand how they can take this momentum that we're building right now beyond the election, right? Because it's not just a sugar rush to get to this one point. It is about building long-term movements um, here, right? And ensuring that young people are trained and that they are developed becoming the next generation of movement organizers. Because like one day, I don't want to have to knock doors. Like I'm, I feel it in my knees right now. I hit like 15,000 steps today and I'm like, oof. It's been a while since Young Dakota did this. Um, and so really thinking sure that like, right now I always say that we're in a generational fight, right? We're in a generational fight to ensure that the Gen Z um, generation is on our side and that they are propelling the movement forward, right? And then every generation after them. And so we're right now where I'm at is, I'm gonna fucking win, Billy. Um, I'm gonna fucking win. And we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> that's how we're gonna do it. Echoing everything Dakota just said, yeah, find us in the field um, in Milwaukee, across the state of Wisconsin, on college campuses, um, whether it's we're mailing, you know, sending mailers to your mailbox if we can't reach you with the door knock or knocking your door, having a conversation or two, um, that's where we'll be. Um, everything, this is the moment, right? We've been preparing for this all year, every year. Um, we're ready. And I think to sum it up, we're ready. Um, and like Dakota said, it doesn't stop at November 8th. We have a uh, not to get ahead of ourselves, but we have a huge, significant state Supreme Court race in the spring. Um, so we're still going, right? And this is not um, this is not just one season at a time, one election season at a time. It's continuous year round. Young people deserve that investment. So thank you all so much. Young people deserve that investment. Thank you for everything you do. And the best way we can all show our gratitude is to give everything we can, organize everyone we can to support your work. Thank you, everyone. Go team. And we'll see you the day after election day to see what the results were of the fruit of our labor. Go team. Let's save our country together. Thank you, everyone. Dakota, Amanda, Jama, Katie, Latasha, Becky, Cindy, and everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this happen. Let's make it happen, y'all. Yeah. Good team.